Okay, afternoon. My name is Lance Dewey. I'm the Assistant State Soil Scientist. If you guys haven't worked with me in, in a while, I, I look around here, and there was a time that I used to know just about every SCD individual in the state. And, you know, that was, I've, I've been in the agency for 18 years, 12 years as a soil scientist with the Soil Survey Division, and the last seven years as the resource soil scientist out of Devil's Lake. So I recently just moved to the assistant state soil scientist here in Bismarck in November. So things are a little bit different. I'm not working directly with the field like I was before. But I have a lot of experience with many of the individuals in this, in this room right now. And we're going to talk a little bit about CTSGs and on-site determinations. So as Kelly was talking about, you know, when you guys are planning and doing things, she referenced 20-year tree heights, okay? There's another caveat to that, and it's called the Conservation Tree Shrub Group. So the Conservation Tree and Shrub Group is a group of soil groups based on chemical and physical characteristics. We're gonna talk about those today. What's unique about this little trivia on this front page is this little marker is actually the first shelter belt planted with America's new New Deal back in, you know, the, the turn of the century with FDR when they did the New Deal. So does anybody know where that was, the first tree row that was planted on the New Deal? Without looking at that, does anybody know? Did anybody know? It was Oklahoma. So that's a little bit of some trivia for you guys. March 18th, which we're almost there, 1935. And that first tree row was planted by the first... Uh, State Forester, George Phillips from Oklahoma. A little trivia there for you guys. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is understanding the soil, the soil series, and the soil map unit, the CTSG interpretation. And then we're going to look at some on-site investigations, hints and examples that you guys can do when you're out there looking at CTSGs. Okay. What is a soil? I'm gonna get you guys involved. What's soil? What's that? Organisms. Yep, okay. Is it just a media that you guys are putting your trees in? No, there's more to it than that, okay? So soil is a natural body that's composed of solids, sand, silt, and clay, organic matter, liquid, air, that occurs on a land surface, okay? It occupies space and has horizonation. And horizonation is layers within the soil that have specific characteristics, whether it's color, whether it's texture, um, other inherent soil properties, okay? This media has the ability to support rooted plants and natural environment, so that's important, okay? What's a soil series? I'm going somewhere with this. What's a soil series? Does anybody know what a soil series is? Yeah, you guys have been doing planting for a while. Do you recognize some of these names? You know, Hammerly, Williams, Barnes, Buse. Do you guys recognize those names? Okay. Well, they have individual characteristics that make a soil name. So that's a soil series. So for instance, the Lance soil would be something that has specific characteristics. My top soil is a little thin on top, and I'm a little thick on the bottom. But... Uh, that's how you look at soils, okay? Soil names have specific characteristics. Once you understand that, we can start grouping soils into CTSG groupings, and we'll see that, okay? So a soil series is a group of soils having similar and repetitive chemical and physical properties, representing a specific landscape, okay? Landscape position. These properties include slope shape, color, texture, structure, horizon, things like that, okay? So what I mean it's repetitive is when you go look at the Hecla or Bantry series, you can find that on a specific landscape position. It's always gonna look the same, it's always gonna have the same characteristics. Because of that, we know what we can do with it as a soil scientist, I can interpret that soil. I can say this soil is good for this, 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 this. That's what we do with soils is we use them for general land use planning. Some things are good for them, some things are bad with them. And that's what we're going to talk about today with CTSGs. So what's the soil survey? 
You guys know what the soil survey is? What's a soil survey? Soil mapping, okay. So it's a representation of soils on a landscape, okay. For the young ones that, you know, uh, Kelly had referenced 1996 as the big blizzard year, how many here have, were actually born after 1996? Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. So prior to Web Soil Survey, which is the official location of our soils information, have you guys all done Web Soil Survey or been on Web Soil Survey? Okay. Before that, that document was this. It was a hard book cover. Okay. The same information that you find in Web Soil Survey is here, but this was just a hard copy. This stuff is excellent historical reference, but is now null and void data, okay? So everything we find is on soil survey, web soil survey. So soil survey is a detailed inventory of soils within an area. It's not just county maps, but we look at regions across. So our soil lines go across county lines, okay? They don't just stop at a political boundary, okay? Those are based on, you know, physical graphical areas. So you know, in North Dakota, we have a lot of different things, right? We have sandy ground, we have loamy ground, we have clay ground. So as a soil scientist, what we do is we inventory that stuff. And again, we use it for general land use planning. Once we understand that, what we can do is we can cut out a landscape, okay? Think of a section. You're looking at a section, you're looking at doing a tree planting, right? There's a lot of different things going on out there, right? Some areas are flat. Some areas are real hilly. Some areas are, have depressions. As soil scientists, what we do is we cut out those landscapes, okay? Then we do a statistical analysis on that landscape. We create a polygon and then attach physical and chemical data to it. And we interpret that for general land use planning. We do that at a scale of one to 24,000. So if you're looking on web soil survey and you're looking at those soil maps, those polygons, that line is roughly 50 foot wide. So remember, this is not detailed right here, right now. This is what the soil is. It's a general polygon that we can interpret. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this is what soil mapping looks like. As you can see here, we have different landscapes, right? So again, as a soil scientist, we see those landscapes and we cut them out. Okay, cut out the highs, cut out the lows, cut out the flats. Then we run a transect across the landscape. So this is how we actually soil mapped, is we ran a transect across the land, did a boring every 50, 75, or 100 feet. We drilled that hole, identified the soil, you know, the land soil or the gym soil or the hammerly, and then we ran statistical analysis on that landscape. Then what we do is we slap on a map unit name, and then we interpret it. So in this case, these high areas that are here, the F144B, which is Barnes, Buse, three to 6% slopes, has a specific landscape to it. It looks, it has a specific look to it, okay? The 143A, which is a Barnes, Sevilla, zero to 3% slope, has a specific look to it. It has specific soils to it. And that's where we go into something called a soil map unit concept. Okay, so each of these soil map units has a concept to it. I know what it looks like on the ground, so as a soil scientist, I can write it down and spell it out. So I already know what a 144B looks like, I already know what a 143A looks like as a soil scientist, and it's my job to teach you know, people in the field how to identify the landscape. But we also have concepts. So each of these concepts has that written data about what this landscape looks like. Okay, F144B looks like this. F100A looks like this. F101A looks like this, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is the soil map unit concept in detail. Again, we spell it out what each of these polygon landscapes look like. What I'm trying to get at is to let you guys know that when we're out there doing soil mapping, it's pretty detailed. We've put a lot of work into it, but it's not always perfect and we understand that. There's some things about it 
that may or may not, you have to assume or look at a landscape and you might have to make a determination that doesn't fit the norm. Okay, and that's where on-site reviews come in when you guys are doing plantings. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, okay? So this is the F-144B. The reason I'm using this is it's one of my favorite ones. I did a lot of work on it. So this is what a F-144B landscape looks like in the polygon, right? You see a lot of these white eroded knobs. It's very hilly, short, steep slopes, okay? This is what it looks like with LIDAR. You can see the highs and the lows on this, okay? The way we map right now is we call it vector mapping. So what I mean by that is it's just one polygon that we interpret. It's not cut up into many, many different ways. That's called raster mapping. The soil survey division is in the process of doing raster mapping. So this is vector. This is what a raster map would look like. This is what it looks like in a soil scientist's head as well is a kind of an abstract painting. What we have here is a landscape that has specific looks to it that we can carve up because we understand what the soils look like on the landscape, okay? So this particular map unit, F144B, has a name to it. Barnes, Buse, Loams, three to 6% slope. The F is an indicator of what MLRA I'm in. F is MLRA 55A, MLR55B is G. Red River Valley has a certain code. 53A has a certain code. 53B has a certain code. Okay. So that's how we do that. The series number is something that we developed when we were developing up the map unit concepts. The 100 series for MLRA is our glacial till. The letter at the back is our slope percentage. Okay. Typically, A slope, B slope, C, D, E, and F is what you guys will see on your soil map units. They have a code to it. A slope usually runs 0 to 3%, 0, 1%, 0 to 2, or 0 to 3, or 1 to 3, but it's usually 0 to 3. B slope runs into that 2 to 6 or 3 to 6% 6 slope. C is 6 to 9, so on and so forth. Okay? That's how we code it. The names of the soil map unit are your dominant components. That is important because that is what's driving your interpretation for your soils. So in this particular case, Barnes and Buse are our major name components, which means is they make up majority of that polygon. Again, that was from statistical analysis that we did when we ran transects. So Barnes, which would be the yellow soils, come out at 28%. Buse, which is our yellow, comes out at 27%, CV, and so on and so forth. In order to be a named component, you have to be at least 15% of that polygon. Does that make sense? And sorry, Ryan, I keep walking out of the, the line of the, the camera here. So that's how, we, that's how we do that, okay? And so on and so forth. So all the soils that are below 15% are called minor components. Okay, they're not as important, but percentage-wise they could be, right? So you look at 14, 14, 5, and 12, right? That makes up roughly 50% of your polygon. Okay, that's important. So when you do interpretations, there's a couple of different ways we can do it. One, you can do it by dominant component, which you would just be running your interpretation off the barn's name. Or you can look at dominant condition, which looks at all the soils in that polygon, and then spits out an interpretation for you, okay? What's important about this is each of these soils has a rating to it. So in this case, we're looking at CTSG. We've grouped all of these soils with specific CTSGs based on physical and chemical data, okay? And then we put them in groups, okay? The CTSG, interp. So all of our soil components, phases, soil map units are placed into groups, okay? This was something that uh, our data is based on the National Forest Manual. CTSGs are put into groupings of one to 10, and we'll talk about each of these groupings. Tree and shrub species are linked to the CTSGs. So if you go to your 20-year tree heights, 
how do you look at it? Is it, it has a tree across the top is your CTSGs. And again, those trees, have, there's a lot of st stats behind why those trees fit into specific CTSG groupings, okay? And we understand that because not all trees do well on certain soils. North Dakota can be tough, right? We have limiting factors when it comes to, you know, carbonates in the soil. Water is a major, major, major limiting factor within the state, especially as you go out west. So we group all of these and we're going to go through those groupings. Those groups can be subdivided, okay? And the subdivisions have codes to them. A C would be clay, D is a restrictive layer, K or KK is carbonate, calcium carbonate equivalent, which is a very important. G tells you there's sand and gravel there. H, which we don't use much, would be histosols. That would be our organic soils. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. N would be sodium affected. S is sandy. And W is for wet wetness. Okay. So are you guys all familiar with the CTSG handbook? We have this little guide that we produced as soil scientists to help individuals in the field identify CTSGs. Who has not seen this? Raise their hand. Okay. This will be something that you can use or will be using out in the field. Okay. And again, this breaks down all of the CTSGs that we'll be talking about. Again, based on the National Forest Manual and our tacit knowledge as soil scientists on what works here in North Dakota. Okay. So when you actually look at interpretations, there's a couple of different ways to do this, okay? When you're talking about something that is non-on-site, let's say you guys are in the planning stage and you go into web soil survey. We have an interpretation under land classification called CTSG, okay? That CTSG, you can produce a couple of different things. One, it can produce for each individual polygon one number, one grouping, okay? based on a dominant condition, okay? So for instance, Kelly had mentioned something about CTSG-10. Overall, that interpretation would spit out that this specific soil polygon has some issues to it. In our mind, as producing the interpretation, it has characteristics that make planting not good and most likely not gonna be successful. However, Remember, those soil polygons are made up of m many, many soils. Just because it says it's 10, doesn't mean there's not a location that can't be planted on and you might be successful. But you just gotta be wary of what those conditions are and we'll talk about those a little bit more. So what will happen here is, for instance, um, this F1153B Cirrus Ballot in Sevilla, zero to 4% slope, the dominant condition on this tells us that it's CTSG3. That's a good start for planting, okay? But you still always want to go on site, right, and take a look to see if something's off or something looks weird. Because what happens is, again, every soil that here has a CTSG link, link to it, okay? Again, we have an, a, a soil here that has a 10 to it. So just because that polygon says it's a specific grading doesn't necessarily mean you can or cannot plant it, but it does give you a dominant condition. So most likely that polygon is going to reach a 10, or I'm sorry, reach a three. But remember, you have multiple choices within there. And that's why sometimes you might need a soil scientist to come in and help you if things just don't add up or things are weird, okay? But this is a good start. When you are doing planting, when you're looking at the CTSGs, looking at a dominant condition within web soil survey, it, it gives you an, a pretty good idea on what's gonna be on the landscape. So we'll talk about these CTSGs individual. So CTSG1, okay, has certain characteristics to it. This one has, again, subscripts of uh, K, KK, and S. S again means sandy, Ks mean that you have carbonates. Okay, so we can break these groups out. These are typically non-restrictive. You have a lot of good things about a CTSG1 soil, okay? They're very deep, they're very dark, they're very black. They have 
good water table, things like that, okay? Is there still some problems within there? Yes. But when it comes to 20-year tree heights and your 20-year trees, this is pretty unlimiting, okay? The grouping itself. CTSG2, again, is a pretty good soil, but you start having some limitations come on where you have some poorly drained soils, but they're drained. You have some wetness, high pH, things like that. And you have some specific groups in here that are real problems. The one is CTSG2KK, which we've been doing a lot of work on within the state, trying to figure out what's going on. These soils, especially a 2KK, has a high risk for salinity, okay? Salinity is a phase, and we'll talk about that in, in some of our examples, that can have a severe reduction on tree growth or it will kill them straight out, okay? CTSG3, you'll see this quite a bit on the landscape, okay? These have a specific location, usually long back slopes, sometimes on your, your top of your hills, things like that. They're well-drained, they're deep, they have little issues. Competition from weeds and grasses could be an issue. Water erosion on slopes, usually you have something that has um, some sort of slope to it. They have a limitation, I think uh, it's anything it has to be less than 15% slopes in order to plant on it. CTSG4, again, you have some subscripts with it, Cs and CKs. These are good soils, they have loamy surfaces. The limitations on these is they have some clays to them and they have some clay pans. You have to be very cognizant of what's going on out on the landscape and what these might look like, okay? CTSG5, we start getting into some sandy material, okay? These, these specific soils have loamy or fine loamy sand textures. These are actually when it comes to water retention, these are better than sand. These are more of a loamy type soil, but they have a lot of sand content to it. And when you think of a soil texture, these are sand, silt, and clays. These specific soils have a high amount of sand in them, but they still have a lot of clay and silt in them too. They do hold on to water, but they can get droughty in drought conditions, okay? CTSG6, we start running into issues uh, with restrictive layers. In this case, we look at something maybe like a bedrock. The bedrock here in North Dakota, at least in, in the eastern side, would be Pierce Shale, which is going to be in specific locations. Out west, you're going to run into a lot of sedimentary rock. Mudstones, siltstones, sandstones, things like that. Okay. These, especially here, um, you have your six Gs. Six Gs, typically you run into some sands and gravels, okay? So again, we're talking about you know, this, but again, you have an outline with your CTSG handbook, your field guide that helps break these down even more. In your 20 year tree heights, there's also other information that talks these soils when it comes to physical and chemical characteristics, okay? Problems with uh, CTSG6 is droughtiness, competition. You might have some steepness to it, things like that. CTSG7, okay? CTSG7, so now you're starting to get into something that's really, really sandy, okay? So if you understand soil textures, and we'll, we'll look at this a little bit later, but in CTSG5, your, your uh, textures are loamy, Fine sandy loams, sandy loam textures, okay? So you're still loamy. Once you get to CTSG7, you start running into sandier textures. This would be something called loamy sand, okay? It's important to be able to work with your soil scientist or your resource soil scientist on trying to understand texture a little bit better, okay? And these are things that our resource soil scientists can do is, you know, as a group, you know, your CDUs, your technical man management units, you guys can ask for assistance from the resource soil scientists. If you want more information and hands-on experience on soil texturing or understanding textures, that's what they're there for, okay? And I know we're sitting here talking about this. It's easier to talk about it than it is to actually, you know, get out in the field and do it without, you know, experience. This is where you lean on, you know, NRCS, 
especially if you have a veteran crew in there. This is where you lean on your veteran crew for SCD if you're lucky enough to have that. And, you know, start looking at textures because there's a big difference in a CTSG5 versus a 7, okay? Your tree and shrub species are very limited on a 7 and a little bit more wide open on a 5. And all it is is a soil texture. And that soil texture is directly related to available water content and the ability for that soil to hold on to water. Because what is our limiting factor when it comes to trees and shrubs is water, right? So this is, this is important to understand, okay? CTSG8, okay? This one, we see it a lot too on the landscapes. These are going to be your, your, high, your high ridges. This is going to be the tops of your hills, things like that. The CTSG has a K behind it, 8K. K, again, is a calcium carbonate indicator, okay? In this particular picture, all that white stuff is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is a limiting factor for many tree and shrub species, okay? This is why we have certain trees and shrubs in North Dakota that we don't have in other places. One of them I can think of would be like maple, right? Have you ever walked, you know, or drove around North Dakota and say, hey, where's all the maple? It's because they don't grow here, okay? And this is what I'm getting at when it comes to 20-year tree heights and when you guys are doing planning is not every tree and shrub does well on certain soils. So it's important to understand what you're seeing on the landscape and understand what that CTSG interpretation is telling you in Web Soil Survey. So again, for instance, maples hate carbonate. They like acidic soils. If you have carbonated soils, they're high pHs. High pH means you're something in the, the 7.5, 7.9, 8.0 for pH. That's that's pretty carbonated, okay? So this is like dumping baking soda within a soil. Some trees hate that, okay? Again, this one has high calcium carbonate. You're high and dry as well on this specific landscape. It's deep, but you're high and dry. So not only do you have a carbonate issue, these soils can get a little bit droughty, okay? So this is why in your 20-year tree heights, 8K has a limitation on trees and shrubs is because it's not the best soil to grow a tree and shrub on, right? Okay. Troubled soils. So now we start getting into some of these troubled soils. Okay. CTSG9. So we do break these out into specific indicators. 9N and 9W is one that we use a lot. 9N is an indicator of sodicity. Who here has heard of sodic soils? Okay, maybe it's easier. Who hasn't? Okay, so sodic soils are soils that are chemically saturated with sodium. Okay, that doesn't sound real good, does it? Well, they're not. They're not good soils. Okay, so in your, cal or in your um, cation exchange capacity, so when you're cycling nutrients, you've heard of like base saturation or things like that. You know, you have calcium and magnesium and... and you know, phosphorus and, and stuff within a soil, these cations, okay? You have none of that in there. It's all saturated with sodium. And what that does is it messes with clays. It messes with uh, ion toxicity. It doesn't allow a soil to do a lot of different things. And because of that, when you plant something in there, it can die. So when it comes to sodic soils, there's three types. There's okay, there's bad, and then there's god-awful terrible. <laughs> so the good ones, actually, we throw those into CTSG4, okay? Those are ones that have clay pans. Once you start getting into worse sodic soils, you start running into 9Ns, okay? Past 9N is a 10, okay? Our 10s are going to be leptic soils. Leptic, what I mean is it's not only sodic, it's also saline. So it's like a, a, a double punch. So those end up going into CTSG 10. I would rely on your interpretation, CTSG interpretation from Web Soil Survey to help you identify if 9N is the dominant condition. It also has a specific look to it. So when you go out on the landscape, when you start recognizing some of these soil names, you know, Daglum and 
Kresbard and Cavour and Miranda, Uranda, things like that, these are sodic soils. Once you see that on a map unit, work with your, again, work with your soil scientists to understand sodic soils. Once you see that on there, you may want to reconsider planting, you know, out there, okay? There's going to be all these situations, especially if you go out on site and you look at it and it just doesn't look good. If it doesn't look good to you, it's not going to look good to a tree, right? Okay, so remember that. 9W, okay, this is what's important is we have saline soils out there, right? Okay, so our 2KK soils can get worse, okay? And they, they can become saline, okay? So our 2KK soils are these somewhat poorly drained calcic soils that have a water table that comes up and down, okay? It's called a, a, a discharge system. These soils under the right conditions become, can become saline, okay? So now a 2KK can move to a 9W, okay? This is where it's important to understand electric conductivity in EC. When I say salinity, who doesn't know what I mean by salinity? Okay. So again, salinity is a condition that can affect soils because of a fluctuating water table and the amount of soluble salt within a soil, okay? We measure electric conductivity or the amount of salt using an electric conductivity meter, an EC meter, okay? What that does is that's actually measuring the resistance within your slurry of, of whatever you're making. In an EC one-to-one -one reading, we do that, that's our field reading. It's one part distilled water, one part soil. Usually we use um, you know, it, it would be a teaspoon or a half a cup or whatever you want to do, but it's equal amounts. You stir up that slurry, you put in this EC meter, and it reads the resistance. The more salt that is within a soil, the higher the resistance. That resistance comes out as a number. The higher the number, the higher the amount of soluble salt within there, which we then rate as slight salinity, moderate salinity or strongly saline, okay? When you're looking at nine W's and you're running an EC one-to-one, -one, which again is your field method, your measurement has to be less than 4.0, okay? That is slight, saline, slight salinity. That is just on the edge of moderate saline, okay? So what, what's important about electric conductivity and salinity is every species of plant has a resistance, okay? So it can, you know, it can handle it or it can't handle it, just like all of us, right? Think of it as a, a pain threshold, okay? So how can we handle, you know, salinity? Some plants have the genetics to do it, some plants don't, okay? One of the crop plants that we have, crop production, that hates salinity is soybeans or beans. Beans hate it, okay? So anytime you go in a field and you drive around and you see these void areas, it's usually because salinity has affected that ability to germinate and grow. Same thing can be said for a tree and a shrub, okay? Certain species can handle it, certain species can't, okay? And that's why we do have ratings when it comes to CTSG 2KK and 9Ws, we have certain trees and shrubs that can handle a little bit of salinity, okay? More so more shrubs than you can trees typically. So does that make sense? Okay. So again, these are our troubled soils. These are things that something's changed on these soils. We can group them. We can still plant on them, but use caution. Okay. CTSG 10, call me, maybe. Okay. Soils in this group have one or more characteristics which severely limit planting, survival rate, growth of trees and shrubs. So when you think about things that would affect a, a tree or a shrub, just without looking at this, I know it's already up there, but what would be some things that you could think of that would reduce a, a tree's ability to grow? Tell me some things that would stop a, a tree from growing or a shrub from growing. What's that? Too wet. Too wet, Too wet is one. Gravel. Gravel is another one, because why? Because we can't Right, okay. So. What's that? Too dry. Too dry, yes. So in a case of gravel, droughtiness, or sands, droughtiness is one. 
What are some other ones? Carbonates. Carbonates, okay. So some restrictive layers that we have would be like bedrock, right? Okay, so I have a soil that has, you know, 14 inches of loam over the top, and then I hit bedrock. That tree, a shrub might grow, right? But because its roots can never go any deeper than that, it's just never going to get real big, okay? So soil depth is one that we identify as being a restrictive feature, okay? Clay pans are also another one that we have. More so out west, you have soils that have a lot of clay pans. Again, that's like going into bedrock. You know, you're a nice, you know, root going down into the ground and you run into what? This clay layer. This clay layer may not be able to get through. So that's your limiting factor, okay? Some other things we think about, you know, you, you mentioned gravel, but soil texture, right? Sand, silts, and clays. Not only that is we have coarse fragment modifiers, okay? So have you ever heard of the term gravelly loam? So in our textural triangle, we have, you know, specific textures, silt loam, clay loams, loams, you know, loamy sands, things like that. Each of those textures can have a modifier to it based on the amount of coarse fragments. So our coarse fragments are gravel, cobbles, stones, boulders, flagstones, and such like that, okay? And we can look at those in different percentages. So we can look at that as like a gravelly loam, or if it has a higher percentage, it's a very gravelly loam. If it's got a lot of gravel in it, it's extremely gravelly loam, okay? So these again are limiting factors when it comes to not only being able to plant a tree and shrub in there, but it also might affect your equipment, right? Okay. So if we come across a, a soil that has been mapped as extremely stony, are you going to get any equipment through there in order to plant a tree or a shrub? No, probably not. Okay. So just take that into, in, into effect. Slope is another one. It goes back to kind of your, your water restrictions. Okay. If the steeper the slope, the less likely water is going to infiltrate, correct? Okay. If you're flat, water's going to infiltrate. If you're steeply sloped, or even if you're like a convex or a concave slope, it's going to different, you know, it's going to manage your water a little bit differently. So slope is one. Each of those CTSGs has a slope rating, a maximum slope rating. Okay. So for instance, like a CTSG three, you can't go above 15% but I don't know if I'd want to have equipment on 15% anyhow, right? If you guys were using the equipment to plant. So that's a restrictive feature. Other features like your 8K, which is your high and dry soil, your maximum allowable slope, I believe is 9%. If you go above that, your water issue becomes a real reality and you start having a droughty issue, okay? Vegetation, okay, is another indicator, right? It's a huge indicator. And I'm really going to harp on this in the next, you know, probably 20 minutes on site identification and understanding things. Okay. If you go out there and, and a site and the farmer wants to, or producer wants to plant trees here, right? And it's a crop field and nothing's growing. Your trees and shrubs aren't going to grow either. Okay. If crop isn't going to grow, your trees and shrubs aren't going to grow. Remember that. Please remember that. Okay. Because there's been many times when a lot of reasons why trees and shrubs end up getting in and aren't going to be successful because somebody just disregarded what they were looking at and seeing. Okay. Vegetation, ortho imagery is a big thing to use when you guys are doing planting. Please use it. Because every time you plant something that fails, what happens? You start being questioned, right? Your technical expertise, not only for SCD, but NRCS, is starting to be questioned. We're supposed to be the technical experts. Remember that, guys, okay? It's very important. SCD is a partner with NRCS. NRCS is a partner with SCD. We work together, okay? If NRCS says, hey, look, maybe this ain't such a good idea, even if cost sharing is or isn't involved, they say, I, I don't think this is a good idea, maybe you guys have a discussion, okay? It is okay to say no to a producer. Remember that, okay? Because when it comes to being successful, 
getting conservation down, it has to be successful, okay? Just remember that, and that's my soapbox moment, sorry. But you're gonna see some examples that we have on reasons why this is brought up, and this is why we talk about it, okay? Okay. So CTSG and bedrock, here's an example, okay? So you have a loamy material that was deposited by the glaciers overriding pure shale, okay? So this would be like your, um, I'm trying to think what the number is, like a, a six, there's a 6D for when it comes to bedrock. So yeah, 6D, so surface and subsoil layers form a specific ribbon, slopes are less than 15%. You have to have soils that are thicker than 20 inches, okay? On this one, okay? Yeah, if bedrock is less than 20 inches, then it jumps to a CTSG 10, okay? In this sp specific spot, okay? This particular soil I think is uh, uh, Edgley. It's either Cloten or Edgley, I think Edgley. But uh, again, there's a reason if this particular bedrock is less than 20 inches, it really impedes the ability for your tree and shrub to grow. And this is why. This is why this would go to a CTSG 10, okay? You may not always have a cut like this, but again, when you use your web soil survey, survey interpretation, it might give you an overall rating of a 6D. If that's the case, if you're not comfortable or anybody within your office isn't comfortable going out and digging a hole, maybe that's why you call a soil scientist. Call me, maybe, okay? If you guys can't do it, then call your resource soil scientist, okay? So this is what it looks like, is a 6D. What type of material and where is it? So it goes back to the gravels and sands discussion, okay? Again, you have a textual triangle here. If you're not familiar with the textual triangle, the area over here is sands. The area here in the middle is loamy material. The area up here is clay material. So when I talked about the difference between a five and a seven, a CTSG five and a seven, sevens, are right here. Tens are right here. Fives are right here. Okay, so it, again, it's important to understand what you're seeing for a texture when you're out on the landscape, if you have that ability to soil texture. And again, that's where you call in your resource soil scientist. Okay, so what's important about this is, again, there's a couple of different things we'll talk about, is why things become a CTSG 10 and what things look like in the field. Again, this is part of your on-site investigation, okay? If you come out to a soil and it looks like this, don't call a soil scientist. It's not gonna be plantable, guys, okay? Especially if you have gravels like this at the surface, okay? You have gravel at the surface here, but it's very sandy, okay? This is where you make a determination, okay? It may come out as a CTSG 10 in your interpretation. Maybe it comes out as like a 6G. But if you walk out there, again, you're supposed to do on-site evaluations, right? If you go out there and it looks like this, don't plant it because you're probably not gonna do very well, okay? Please, please don't, okay? And again, the caveats on, on gravel is if you have less than 14 inches to sand or gravel, and when I talk about sand, I'm talking about sand on the textual triangle, it's gonna be a CTSG 10. Again, it goes back to water retention ability to hold water, ability for something to grow. If you have 14 inches of loamy material, and again, loamy material is gonna be here in the center of the textural triangle over sands and gravels, then you can throw that into CTSG six. And again, that is broken down in your CTSG field book, okay, on how to do that. If you have greater than 10 inches of sandy loam textures and no gravel, you throw that into CTSG 5. If you have greater than 20 inches of loamy sands or loamy fine sands and no gravel, so it's just a sandy material, you can throw that into CTSG 7. So that's how that works, okay? It's not always gonna be a 10, but remember, if you see indicators like this, don't plant it, please don't. 
If you have gravel at the surface like that, it's not going to work. Okay. Understanding the difference between CTSG 9 and 10, or 9W and 10. Again, we talk about salinity here. Okay. This is where it is important to understand what you're seeing on, a, on your ortho image. Okay. In this particular case, in your top left-hand corner, with the yellow arrow, that is showing salinity on your map. What does that look like on the ground? It looks like this. Okay. Your soil textures or your soil profile looks like this. All the white stuff there is specs. Okay, and again, use your EC one-to-one -one readings in the field, and if you need help identifying that or, or doing that, rely on NRCS. Rely on your resource soil scientists to help teach you to do that, to be able to do those readings to make decisions. Because the other thing, too, is, is this worth it? Is it worth it to mess with this? Okay. If your soils look like this when you go out to the landscape, even though maybe the CTSG says, okay, we're supposed to be a 2KK, but obviously we have a saline issue, you have to say no here because you're not going to, no matter what you plant, it's not going to be successful. Okay. Unless you run an EC one to one and it says it's less than four. Okay. That's where your uh, CTSG 9W comes in. But again, you got to make determinations when you walk out to the landscape and it looks like that. Does it even matter if you run an EC one to one? Do you just look at it and say, maybe this isn't a good idea? Or maybe we need to look at a different location to plant. If you still want to do your wildlife planting, Mr. Farmer, then maybe we look at a different location because here it's not going to work. Okay. It's okay to say that, guys. It is okay. Okay. Here is one that I've, I did uh, in a county, one of my field uh, visits. Vegetation response. Okay. They wanted to replant that line. Okay. At one time, it grew, right? But at what, you know, at what point is it important to grow there or is it you know, important to move off and stuff like that? So vegetation response, don't ignore it because it's telling you something. Okay. In this case, you see the, the, the trees are real bad and then they start getting a little bit better, right? Okay. Once you see that, Use that on-site investigation to help make your determinations, right? Okay. So that's what that looked like on the east side. Or that would have been on the west side. So that is all salinity all the way up to the surface. Okay. So again, that's the difference between a 9W and a 10. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. You guys have the skills and the ability to do this, to make a determination by just looking at something that's responding, right? Here's another one that we had. Understanding that the CTSG, so this polygon, was mapped out as an F142A, which is a Sevilla loam. Sevilla is a CTSG1, right? There should be no restrictions. But look at it, okay? Clearly there's something wrong there. Whether we mapped it wrong or something changed on the landscape or, or they did something, but this was the planting area, okay? Even after discussions with NRCS, this was still planted. I was asked to come out here and identify why this planting didn't work. Judging by the ortho image, I think I already had an idea why it didn't work, but Again, this was still planted, and, and that's not really okay, but it was still done, okay? Maybe if they wanted to move this up off of that area, maybe that would have worked better, okay? So there's always different ways to do plantings. If the planting has to go in or is going to go in, always look at your best scenarios, okay? When I talk about what you're seeing on site, it tells you a story, okay? Okay? So in this particular case, this planting area was full of kochia. If you understand salinity, kochia is a big indicator of, you know, soils that have ECs that are very high. Other indicators are salt grass, foxtail barley, or being completely void of vegetation, period. Okay. 
and I'm not harping on, you know, the SCV on this one, but it just, we, we need to do better, okay? And in this particular case, the planting was a failure because the planting probably should have never went in, right? There's plenty of indicators here that suggested maybe we do something different. And this is what the soils look like was it was full of salt, okay? So, again, when you have situations like this, no matter what the producer's saying, please don't plant this because it's not going to ever, ever work out for you. And how many times are you going to have to replant before you just give, give up and abandon, okay? So please don't do this, okay? We, we expect better out of all of us, okay? Sodic soil, so CTSG 4 versus 9N versus 10, okay? Here's another one that uh, and, um, they looked at doing the planting across there. This has a specific phototone to it, right? It's showing you something. Vegetation response, and you'd see this from an ortho image. Would you ever want to put trees or shrubs through there? No, okay? You can move up slope or down slope, but don't go through there. Even if it is a 9N, you're, you're really limited on the, the amount of, of trees and shrubs you can put in in a 9N, let alone a 10, right? 10 is not plantable. When you backed off off of this, you know, you come here to the south, it's a CTSG4 and you have a little bit more op options in order to plant. But again, when you're out there doing a planting line, these are easy things that you guys can do. You guys have the skills to be able to see things that don't add up. And that's what we're asking for you is help us out as resourceful scientists. You know, don't call us out for this if you want to plant there, you know, look at changing the line. And if you need us out there to help you change the line, that, that's one thing. But don't call us out here and say, I want to plant through here. Can I? No, you can't. No, no, don't. Please don't. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to you guys is you guys have the ability and the skill set to make determinations, okay, to help us out to make something successful. Again, when you see situations like this, maybe we need to adjust that planting a little bit, okay? whether it's to the north or south or east or west, okay? Wetness is another sign of water tables. So if you're going through this, let's say you're doing a planting through here, right? Okay, you're gonna run across the pothole. That pothole has a signature to it, okay? It's a depression. You have redox amorphic features that indicate a high-end water table. You have surface crusting, which indicates a water issue, okay? I'm not opposed to that planting. You're just gonna to have to skip over that pothole, right? Because you can't plant through a pothole. So maybe we adjust that planting, you know, to the east, move that to the east or west, okay? Make sure that the producer understands, hey, if we plant here, you're gonna have a gigantic gap, okay? Depending on the size of the pothole, okay? So these are things that you guys can do is indications of wetness. Depressional areas, Redoxomorphic features when you're digging a hole that which indicate a fluctuating water table and surface crusting. Slope issues, like I talked about, all of these soils have a, um, within the CTSGs, each group has a maximum slope rating, okay? This is what makes things either successful or not successful, successful okay? So in this particular case, the, the field office ran a slope map using ArcGIS. They were able to have, they had that skill set to be able to do that. That helped them determine where maybe the best planting line would be or why things would not work out the way they would work out. So remember, each of these, this had a lot of uh, 8Ks to it and some threes, which is pretty typical for a Zoll Williams map unit. Williams is a CTSG3 and the maximum slope on it is 15%. Zoll is an 8K with a maximum of 9% slopes. So as you're running this line here, it came out as, you know, we have some areas there that are tens. We have some areas based on slope that could be a 10. Who here has never ran a slope or knows what like a, a clinometer is? Okay.
one of the skill sets I hope you guys are able to develop with the help of, you know, veteran people within your agency, NRCS, or your resourceful scientist is being able to shoot slope. Shooting slope is just like this. It's always best with a buddy, okay? Especially a buddy that's about your height. If you have a buddy that's really tall and one that's really short, the short one needs to raise their hand. And then you shoot at eye level. So that's what you do. Is you shoot at eye level, you look through the clinometer, and it gives you a slope rating, a slope percentage, okay? And this is what it looks like through the target is slope rating, okay? And that's how you shoot slope. So if you come out to an area and it looks steep, maybe the best thing to do would be shoot slope because each one of these has a limiting factor on it, okay? So if you don't have that skill set, we can help you develop that. Ask questions. There's got to be somebody somewhere in your, your technical management unit or your CDU, fellow SCD members that have shot slope with a clinometer. Okay. So again, know the slope requirements for each CTSG. And again, that is highlighted within your field guide, also within your 20-year tree heights. Okay, again, slope issues. Okay, another one that uh, I was asked to talk about is we've had a number of questions come up in the past and recently about planting in feedlots. Have any of you guys had this question come up from a producer? Okay. What are some of the issues that you can think of about planting in a feedlot or in a, in a feedlot or around a feedlot? Compaction. Compaction. High nutrient load. High nutrient load. Salinity. Salinity. Very good. Okay. So a couple of different things that's happening is within the feedlot itself. Okay, how long has that been a feedlot and how much scraping has been done with the tractor and the front end loader? Okay, scooping out that compost, right? So now you're starting to affect the amount of topsoil that is on, on your ground, right? So that's issue one. Issue two, compaction. Okay, you've had animals there for a very long time, right? No vegetation, been pounded on for a number of years. You are starting to impact your soil. Okay, so the reason why a lot, of, a lot of our soils can go to a CTSG-10 is because it's no longer native soil. It's been manipulated in some way, whether it's been scraped or leveled, land leveled or, or whatnot, that impacts a tree's ability to grow, right? Okay, so when you impact that stuff and when you impact a structure and you get into compaction, now you start having problems with root penetration, water infiltration, things like that. The other big one is nutrient load, okay? I can't even tell you probably what the nitrogen load on this was, but it was, I, I didn't even have a soil test because there's no point to it, right? Okay. When you have a high nutrient load, it takes a long time to reduce that. A lot of times the way they do it is they'll put in a perennial grass to kind of mine out that extra, you know, that, that extra amount of nutrients just to get it down to a level where you can actually maybe plant a different grass, okay? When it comes to trees and shrubs, they're gonna burn up, okay? The reason I know this is within that feedlot area, the trees that were there were already burning up or burnt up or, or crisp, okay? They had been to the, to the west, what, or actually to the north of this, were gigantic cottonwoods that had been mature and they were now dead because of nutrient load, okay? There is no specification or information out there. There's very little on nutrient loads when it comes to trees and shrubs on what is toxic and what is acceptable. This is research that we've done. Plant Materials Center has been in on it too. We've been trying to look for this stuff. It's difficult. But what I can say is if, if you're unsure and they run, you know, run the, the producer runs a soil test on it, if the nutrient load looks high for a crop, it's probably gonna be high for a tree and a shrub. So just remember that, okay? These are not plantable, okay? You have to be real wary about the areas outside of the feedlot area too, especially if there's some slope to it, okay? If this slopes to the south, let's say, do you wanna plant trees to the south of that? No, because leaching is gonna end up moving that nutrient load to those trees. 
even though everything looks good, over time it's going to burn up, okay? Especially if you understand how water runs. This particular spot, crazily enough, has come up many, many times by a specific producer because the application's in and it keeps coming up, right? So it's always every year, no, 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 okay. Reason this is, is you see me standing on top, that's five foot of compost. They wanted to plant through here. It's not acceptable, okay? It wasn't gonna work. And that's what it looked like. My partner that was there with me, she was at the bottom of that and took the picture. And I was essentially, I could have walked off that and stepped right on her head because that's how high up it was. So when you have these feedlot questions come up, this is the answer. You tell them, this is not going to work out, you know, when it comes to cost sharing or non-cost sharing, because we want your conservation to be successful. This is not going to be successful. These will burn out. They will die. Okay. Remember that. Do you guys have any questions on this just because it's come up a number of times? Yes. How long would you be able to let it sit idle, do you think, before you could go in there? Well, if, you're, if you want to go that route, then you start taking a soil test at the beginning, right? Okay. I can't tell you how much time. If it sets idle with nothing on it, it's not gonna, it will leach out maybe over time. But, you know, are, are you looking at 20 years, 30 years? Are you doing anything to remedy, you know, remedy that? Are you putting in um, grass, anything that's gonna help mine out that, veg or mine out that nutrient? Kelly. Did you say scrape 10 feet? Yeah. Let me ask you guys that. Is that worth planting a tree in a shrub? Unless it, it, it's, you know, a, a make or break when it comes to, you know, wind protection, right? Maybe at that point, the best thing to do is put up a, you know, a, a, a snow fence or something like that, right? If you have to go through that much, you know, cost-wise in order to get a tree and a shrub to plant, that's difficult. We're running into issues also with subdivisions, okay? Subdivisions where they've gone out, they've done land leveling, things like that, and then they want to, after the fact, plant, you know, trees around each lot, and they'll come to the SCD, right? You guys are supposed to follow specs, okay? NRCS specs, that's part of what you guys are supposed to do. I, I understand there, there's a lot of discussion about that, you know, because, you know, there, there, there is money involved and in, in things like this. But, you know, do you want to be successful? You know, is this, you know, what are we going to do or what's, what's the make and break on this, right? So that's, that's one thing that we've come across quite a bit is these new subdivisions that are going in. Um, you know, hopefully... If you get out into the public eye, you can explain to, you know, subdivision developers, hey, maybe you guys want to put trees in first, then worry about the rest of it, right? Maybe that's something to discuss. Okay. Fill, since we're talking about that a little bit, okay. CTSG 10 fill. Trees and shrubs are not filling it, okay. They're not feeling it. <laughs> Nobody got that. That was, I thought that was pretty good. Okay, so in this particular case, um, you had a house that was built and they did some land leveling. They uh, brought in some fill, laid things up and, and things like that. They wanted, they had done planting that was non-SCD before that and they had asked the SCD to come in and, and you know, add to some of those rows. Well, when we went out there, they had done more work. So the entire area outside was fill, right? They had to come in and, and added some material. That's not plantable, that's a CTSG 10 because it's non-natural soil, okay? It's a mixed material that doesn't have any topsoil. Maybe you have topsoil over top, but it has no structure, no real texture to it. Probably a compaction issue, things like that. 
that's not plantable for those reasons, okay? So in this particular case, they had fill to the south, to the east, and to the north. Outside of that, we were able to get to a CTSG-10, which was about five feet lower than, or I'm sorry, CTSG-2KK, which was about five feet lower than what they had built on. So they had, they had brought in all this fill, leveled that out, built it up, and then built a house on it. And so you, you can only do so much. You just can't plant here. That was all sand and gravel, things like that. Okay. Yes, sir. So like how long does it take to actually get an actual soil back after you've done something like that? Let's say you have grass and cover on there and it kind of start building. Is it decades? You're talking a lifetime. So it is, it's beyond us. You're, you're talking to restore a, a soil naturally back to an extent of what was native, then it's a long time. If you're asking for something that's going to be usable, functional, functional, no matter what you do here, it's still a soil scientist is gonna be able to identify that you've had some modification here and it's gonna be CTSG 10. But in a normal sense, when you come to like reclamation, so you know the coal and the oil industry does reclamation. So they hold bond on that for 10 years, okay? So up by, you know, Falkirk and things like that, they are, they do rec reclamation to all that coal that they pull out, okay? That goes into a perennial vegetation for 10 years before that's bonded out back to the producer. Those are, are functional, only with a perennial vegetation, you're not gonna be able to plant a row crop back in there and be successful. So the, the answer to that is it takes a long time. Okay. So the, the goal is to not do any disturbance to that before, you know, they want to do any trees and, and planting. And, and I understand that's not always able, you're not always able to do that, but have those discussions. Sarah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, unfortunately we see that a lot. You know, I've, I've been in this now for 19 years and a lot of times they want to put trees and shrubs in their worst spots, right? I can't grow a crop there, so let's put trees and shrubs in there and make it wildlife, right? Well, in cases like that, maybe grass would be the best thing for wildlife cover instead of trees and shrubs. So that is kind of a a crash course in CTSGs and soils. I know it's a lot of information, um, but again, you have people to rely on and lean on, especially if you are, are, are new to, you know, the SCB realm and conservation planning, okay? You have your partners, you have resource soil scientists you can li rely on. But we're, we're thinner than what we were a year ago, but uh, uh, they're still there to be able to help you guys, okay? Do you have any initial questions? Uh, Questions right now? Additional questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Yep. Yep. So there's a couple of different ways you can do this, okay? So 
let's say, okay, this is your map unit. He wants to plant right across the line, okay? You can't out, go out there and do an on-site investigation. I understand that. Use your reconnaissance the best you can. Use an ortho imagery, okay? If you are able to do a drive-by to kind of get a look, that's something that's there too. You can do two things is one, when you're looking at this particular thing, it, it gives you percentages and ratings, right? Okay. So in this case, maybe you, you can plan for the most restrictive. That's an option, right? Okay. So I see out of all here, I have, you know, 30 and 8% of a 1KK and a 2KK. Maybe I plan for a 1KK, right? Okay. Or you can take the dominant condition of all this on a weighted average that spits out a CTSG3. So this is what you plan for, right? CTSG3. And if it's real questionable, you can bounce it off your resource soil scientist, NRCS, things like that, and say, hey, this is where we're at, things like that. If it requires an on-site investigation, you plan for three, you might have to change it, right? If, if you have to. Um, I understand how planning comes about. I understand sometimes it's an inconvenient timing that you, can, you, you can't get out to the field and maybe do something and plan it like you want, but you do have a rating there that does give you a CTSG dominant rating of three. So plan for a three. Yes, you can use a dominant condition. Yes. It's a three because it's weighted with a three, a one, and a four, things like that. So in web soil survey, you can do a couple of different things. You can look at your dominant component. Okay, so that means that it would produce a rating based on your dominant soil, okay? You can also do a, um, an interpretation on your most restrictive feature. So in this case, what would happen is if you say, what's your most restrictive? Well, it's a 10, okay? Or you can do a dominant condition. Dominant condition, again, is a weighted average of all the CTSGs and all of our components within that polygon. So in this case, your dominant condition, which is a weighted average, comes out as CTSG3 is what's produced, okay? And that's how a lot of times we do on planning is based on web serial survey, that's what you guys start out with, is looking at that and starting to plan for that. And you can always modify that based on going out to the landscape you know, on site and going, hey, I don't look like a three. I, I think we got some problems. So that's why you're supposed to do on site evaluations as well. I know that's not always the case, but then again, if you can't get out there, you know, look at your ortho imagery. If this comes out as a CTSG3 and I see all these eroded, eroded knobs and it makes up majority of that, that polygon. I say, I don't think this is a three. I, I think we got some problems here. So that's why I drive by and, and things like that or, or asking or de determining, you know, what's on site is, is the best formula. But again, you have a CTSG rating that is produced by Web Solo Survey. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Not as many as we had before. Um, so on the west side of the state, your resource soil scientist is Ruth Anderson. There are three individuals that are in the soil survey office in Dickinson. There is no one in Bismarck anymore for a resource soil scientist. There is three individuals in the Bismarck soil survey office. There's me as the assistant state soil scientist. There is Joseph Cooper in Jamestown as a new resource soil scientist. And then Jordan Larson Thompson takes care of the east side of the state. She's the main contact. So 
Your two main contacts at this point for the east side is Jordan Thompson, Larson, and the west side is Ruth Anderson. There's nobody to the north anymore. He's in Bismarck now. <laughs> yes, he left us. Okay, we'll take a minute to get Ryan set up here.